Okay. Good afternoon. It is February 23rd. Uh, Commissioner Ed Rossing from District 5. I appreciate the opportunity to have this joint meeting uh, with our Board of uh, Education and CCPS uh, leadership. Um, as always, what I'd like to do before we start, um, well, one, not wearing a jacket in respect to President uh, Kenny Kyler, he's wearing the exact same jacket I thought I had, oh, but that's okay. okay, so I'm not giving <laughs> him any hardship, but that's okay. We are going to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, and I am going to stay cool without wearing a jacket. And then let's take a moment of silence um, and reflect on those things you want to reflect on. But for me, uh, at most, and especially this time for Kenny, may your mom always you. be her memories a blessing to you and the family as you go through this time. Okay? Thanks. Stand. <clears throat> make a quick comment before we get started. It's hard to believe they sold two of those jackets. <laughs> well, Thank actually, you. Steve has one, too, so I, I was worried about you wearing the same jacket. You know, Thank that's you. That's okay. I know you do have one of those. That's why I never wear this. Uh, that I would imagine. Okay. So, again, I think we have a relatively... Uh, strong agenda for um, this afternoon and as always we train to standard not necessarily to time so we have scheduled uh, from 4 p.m. to 5:30, and when this is complete this is complete uh, not taking any shortcuts but not prolonging you know a meeting just to have a meeting at least that's my view on on life and uh, if you hadn't seen my not mine, our opening comments during uh, our state of the county. One of the things we highlighted uh, from the podium, and I think all four of us highlighted from the podium, was the importance that education is bringing to Carroll County and the importance of partnership that we have between our Board of Commissioners, our county Carroll government, the uh, CCPS and the Board of Education, along with um, you know, the community college and the career in tech. Um, it's, it's one team, one fight. And uh, I don't think that was lost on any one of us as we, we shared that um, yesterday. Uh, walking into the budget season um, in a relatively short period of time with Mr. Zaleski to my back right, ensuring that I don't say anything too stupid, he'll gib slap me, I think. Uh, or at least virtually, but um, we, want to, we want to get things right. So understanding your needs is going to be very important as we walk through this. Um, with that, uh, again, those are kind of my opening salvo, opening comments. Uh, Mr. President, do you have any uh, opening comments you'd like to share? In, not a lot. Just, again, um, for at least the last three or four years, the two groups have had joint meetings, and I think it's giant. I think we need to keep doing it. And uh, while we may agree to disagree at times, I think it's, it's great, and we need to do it. And then, and just thank you for everybody being here. Should we approve our two sets of minutes from the last two meetings before we get into the agenda? We can do that. And uh, I think it was on the um, left side of the uh, folder. Is that where we were? The uh, January 21st minutes, September 23rd minutes. If we can take a look at those two. Um, let's do them uh, separately. Let's look at uh, September 23rd for a minute. Any appropriate time if there is a uh, 
a motion. I'm glad somebody did strike out Rothschild and put Rothstein. <laughs> uh, that did not go unnoticed by me, so thank you. Uh, wow. Can Push I ups will be had by those who miscommunicate. Isn't that right there, Commissioner Weaver? Just saying. I'm going to move to approve the September 23rd okay. meetings as amended. Good answer. <laughs> but motion, do I have a second? I'll second, and I do have another edit if I could. Please. Okay. Um, beside Commissioner Rothstein at the very beginning, we have Mr. Herbert, President of the Board. So I would just like to acknowledge that it was Ms. Herbert, our President of the Board of Education. It depends at the time. how she's identifying that. And I do appreciate that there. Uh, Ms. Dorsey, so let's make that amendment. So I have a motion, I have a second with that amendment. Any further discussion? Seeing here none, all in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 Unanimous, now let's look at January 30, 21st. <clears throat> Minutes. Um, I think we need to note that it should say 2022. There's no comments. Do I hear a motion to approve the January 21st, 2021 minutes? So moved. Okay, I got a motion. Do I have a second? I got a motion and second. Any discussion? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank and you very much. I'm sorry, I didn't jump in soon enough. Yeah. Um, Devonchi's last name is Mystery with the R. Okay. Thank you. We'll make that correction. Thanks, Pat. Okay, so <clears throat> we got some of the logistics out of the way in approving the minutes. I appreciate that. Kenny, any uh, other comments you may have? Um, no, thank you. Like you said, we got a long meeting. Okay. Um, so the agenda was gone back and forth, I believe, between uh, our board and your board. Um, in crafting this and uh, you know I think it's a it's a mixed bag throughout the agenda so agreement on the partnership project between CCCTC and CMC where are we are right, good afternoon commissioners uh, board members I'm happy to uh, be here today I'll, I'll kick off this first agenda item uh, it's really just a highlight we wanted to make sure we, we shared between our respective boards um, certainly exemplifies one of many positive partnerships that happened here in Carroll County. Um, in this case, the Community Media Center has worked with uh, our staff and students at the Career Technology Center to have the students design and build a pretty involved storage facility uh, at, their, at the Community Media Center. It's a large facility that includes electricity and environmental controls. Um, this project required a joint agreement between the board, the county, and the CMC. And when the joint meeting was initially scheduled back in early January, we added this item thinking we'd be able to sign it at the meeting. In the interim, our, our legal counsel and staff have worked with the county on an agreement to formalize the effort and allow work to proceed. We invited Mr. Turner of the uh, CMC to our board meeting in February, the February 9th board meeting, and recognized him there as a great partner with us. And so just for your reference, um, we have a copy of the MOU in your meeting packet, and we're really excited to be a partner um, in, this, in this project. It show, showcases our students um, and their abilities and the manner in which we all work together in Carroll County for positive outcomes. So we wanted to sort of tout that. Uh, John, you're down there? Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. uh, we just want to sort of tout that partnership. Um, there's a lot going on over in that neck of the woods when you drive by, and now there'll be a little bit more. Um, so we're uh, so we're really excited about that. I'll stop there for any comments or feedback. The way I understand it, the county owns the property, the building CMC, and it's right next to the tech center. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Okay. A great experience for our students. Yeah. And I know the CMC uh, is also doing uh, the sports as of the last couple of years, and uh, 
they did the county wrestling tournament, uh, so they were very proud. I know uh, uh, Stoutzer, Stoutzer was uh, now part of that team over there, so he was pretty jazzed about doing the county tournament uh, over at Westminster, so <clears throat> good stuff. Anything else on this uh, partnership? Is there, uh, <clears throat> are there decision points or a timeline associated with this? John, you know what the exact timeline is for that? I believe they'll be prepared to move forward this, this spring semester and begin the design and then the work over a period of time. So right away, which was kind of the urgency of bringing it right. in January. This is a no-brainer. What do you need from us? anything from you we just wanted to sort of uh, like we said sort of tout that good news it's a great partnership opportunity yeah it is that's even better news yeah. okay <laughs> and it is your property right mr <laughs> normally we hear money <laughs> schedule of uh schedule of future capital renovations i'd be happy to kick that one off as well i know the commissioners expressed a desire to have some uh, deeper understanding of the sequence of schools that are prioritized for modernization in the system. So in the, in the meeting packet, we've included a section from our current educational facilities master plan. We love our acronyms, so we call that the EFMP as well. That's the official facilities planning tool that we're required every year to adopt in June. And this is the document that drives our capital improvement uh, plan request to you all and to the state every so in the document, I'll refer to pages 25 and 26, which discuss modernization priorities. Page 26 has the list of prioritized schools for the 10-year window of the facilities master plan. That prioritization does adjust some over time, but it's determined by a combined physical and functional assessment facility condition index score, or the FCI, as we like to call it, with the acronyms. Just give us one yep. second to get to it, page 26. Yep. 25 and 26, and then like I said, the uh, page 26 has the list of prioritized schools for that 10 year Okay, minute. the combined assessment score mm -hmm. is what you're talking about. Correct. Now I'll remind everybody, all the capital projects are always contingent on available state and county funding. So we try to not only request a reasonable schedule of projects based on what we may be, what may be possible to fund, so at this point, with two major modernizations underway, Career and Tech and East Middle, we have maximized the, the state and local revenue available. So I'll stop there. Um, I know that was, a, like I said, a request of the commissioners for this agenda. And see if okay. there's any additional questions you might have. My only concern, I think, about this is we have 40 buildings, or you have, I think, correct, roughly? to maintain, and if you do one a year, it's 47 years to go through it, uh, and we're out of money right now, but or in that designated funding area, uh, so this will have to get creative, I think, in the future on this, uh, maybe state, some other helps somehow to keep up with your plan. I mean, this is a, I'm sorry, Ms. Oh, I was just gonna say, Commissioner Weaver, uh, thank you for that comment. Um, and I think you know, you've probably seen in several of our discussions at the Board of Ed meetings the, our, our FCI score, um, which is actually part of our strategic plan. So we, we attempted to try to put numbers around, okay, if we just, we, we want to make sure that the overall condition of the school system buildings doesn't deteriorate, right? So we created this FCI score and basically said, okay, how much capital infusion do we really need to put in every year so that that score does not deteriorate? Because so, if that score deteriorates, that means the overall conditions of the building start to deteriorate and start falling behind. And I think we had a number, it, the, when we basically tried to normalize it to an annual number, it was about $44 million that needed to go in every year on a capital basis in order to maintain the school system. So it's one of those shocking numbers um, when you hear it, but it makes sense when you think about, well, if the, if the life of a, of a newly renovated school building is about 50 years, we have 40 some odd buildings. That means you have to do about one a year at a 40 or so million dollar price mm -hmm. tag. So, but it was basically just trying to understand that this is the commitment that it takes from a capital perspective in order to not let the, the school system infrastructure deteriorate. We appreciate your comments about, you know, it's gonna take getting creative. <coughs> Well, 
I would like to bring say it also that now's the time to ask the state for the, funding yeah. to bring that right. up because all I've heard from the state lately is how much money they have, mm -hmm. and they actually have from the, my last uh, meeting with the Mako and so forth, they have actually billions of dollars in the rainy day fund. I'm not saying they're going to give it to the school systems, but now's the time to say this, these are our priorities, these are schools we need to get done and get that to the state as soon as possible because they have the money right now. Last time we met with the delegation, they said, give us projects, what do you, what do you need to do, that kind of thing. So it would be a good idea to, to forward all this information to, to the state delegation, see if they can help out. Yeah, I was thinking. As long yeah. as they have money, let's see if we can get it. I, I, was, I was saying the same thing. Every project that we put in front of the delegation, both in five and in nine, uh, they took on as capital projects, and we got the funding. Um, so we just, and, and they're, like you said, they're asking us to keep, you know, the momentum going in the asks, so. Now, where does Kerwin fit into this? I mean, do they have extra funding for buildings, facilities? No. The blueprint legislation does not, no. No, okay, nothing in it. Darn it. Yeah, no. <laughs> you wish it did. Yeah, but there's, there's, a, there's a school construction bill. Right, right, that's a right. major problem. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's actually a bit of a disconnect, Commissioner Weaver, between the blueprint and, and the other parts of running a school system that might come to light. So, for instance, the, the blueprint requires, and I'm just using an example, the blueprint requires ramping up full day pre kindergarten. Right. But the blueprint was more of a policy and then ultimately a operation budget funding piece of legislation. It didn't address what the capital needs might be associated with programmatic changes like that. So, yeah. the state is making an attempt now to gear up for the blueprint. The AIB, AIB is formed, other things are forming, and MSDE is trying to have some conversation with the Public School Construction Program and the Interagency Commission on School Construction to say, hey, we need to kind of uh, get on a, on a similar page here and think about some of these things. So pulling that string a little bit, <laughs> and I won't go down too far in the rabbit hole, but the pre-K requirement, do we have the facilities here in Carroll County to support that pre-K requirement? So the quick answer is no, probably not. Um, why that's complicated, and this is probably gonna be a theme the superintendent will get to in a moment, there's not yet a lot of very clear guidance coming out of the state, and, and in their defense, the AIB just formed and has one in book, so it's, it's trickling in, it's not coming with speed and clarity. Um, so we're, we're sort of on hold trying to figure a lot of things out, which is really challenging when you're putting together a, a budget and, and, that, and that sort of thing. But when do they expect to have it enacted? Well, they actually um, just presented to, the AIB just presented the ways and means to move the timeline forward. That's sort of the timeline on their end. Right. Developing guidance for a comprehensive state plan that then each local board of ed would have to construct a plan around, and that's nice. It's better to have the guidance you need to build a plan. The challenge we're going to face is we, we don't really know yet. None of the other dates in the law have, have been moved yet, and maybe they will be, but that's not been the discussion so far. So there's other dates that are coming due. So even if our plan isn't due until the fall or winter, it doesn't mean that there aren't other benchmarks that already need to be met or, right. or the risk, for instance, that we can <coughs> make budgetary decisions, implement our plan, and find out sometime in the middle of next fiscal year, oh, the state wishes you had done this with that money instead of that. The, the, those are some of the challenges with the, the other piece well, for sure well, well, okay. So the other piece that's written into uh, the blueprint as it relates to pre-K, and we recognize yeah. we're gonna have to utilize space, is they call for, and they, I think they recognize that when they were writing it, they're asking systems to partner with uh, non-public or private preschool providers in the community pick up some of that responsibility. Right. And we're at the beginning stages of trying to figure out how that might, might work as well. Yeah. It's supposed to ultimately be a 50-50 partnership for to have enough slots for eligible children. Right. I'm trying to stay out of you know, making this into weeds and take it too long. No, no, no that's good. Are, are there enough private slots? Um, those private providers, even if they do exist today, would have to go through a state certification process. Are they willing to do that? Right. So at the right. end of the day, are there enough s 
slots available for that partnership? And if not, what does the state say becomes the local board of ed's requirement? Do we pick up more than that share or not? But those are, there's a lot of questions that not get a lot of answers. Yeah. So those are the kinds of things that we worry about in our yeah. spare time. Commissioner Frazier? Yeah, I was gonna say, this is a, another kind of requirement by the state, but when they required uh, kindergarten to go, we're still three or four schools behind that haven't built the additional space for them. I mean, uh, it's something, if I was you guys, I'd be presenting <laughs> to the board, we'd love to do the next step, but let's, let's go back to the step that we haven't actually completed yet and have us some funding for that. And uh, yesterday, surprisingly so, President Crawford asked if he representing MSDE could come up and meet with us. And well, he said, could they meet with me? And I kind of said, I'm going to throw it on some other people that already have this down to a science and, uh, and we'd love to meet with him. They are frustrated with, with what they've been handed. And he said, I'd, I'd love to get out to Carroll County and hear your thoughts on where this is headed. And I, I assume we want to take him up on that. Sure. We just need to talk a little bit about, and I told him, I, I said, I don't, I said, I'd love to see, I, I said, recently, no one from your board has visited Carroll County. Right. We'd love to get you up here, but if you want us to meet you down there, I'll do it just so we can start this conversation. So uh, we talked two or three times yesterday and he really wants to meet us. And I think it, it'll be a step. It, it's there. They're as frustrated as we are. I is, don't know if they're yeah. more frustrated. It, is, the, is the focus on policy or is it on capital? Because if it's on policy, that's one thing, but if it's on capital projects that we're talking my, about. My, my opinion, and they can tell you more, um, the blueprint um, was set up, thought about for education, for educators, and a lot of good things, but there wasn't a lot of plans with the rooms you need to put these people in, the capital expenditures, the implementation of it, and, and the time frame. And, and now the rubber's meeting the road, and I think everybody's saying, oh my gosh. Yeah, so hopefully it'll turn to capital. <clears throat> and what the state can do, like... Yeah, know, I think it has to. So it may start off one way, but it's, <coughs> uh, it's going down the road of policies of pre-K and other requirements. Hopefully they'll say, okay, where are we going to get the funding to grow these facilities? And, and, and optimistically, while, while it's a great idea, I yeah. think they're going to look at the dates. I, they got to look at the dates. I think that's what the ASB <coughs> presented some date shifts. But again, as, as, as you alluded to, Scott or John mentioned earlier, we're not sure exactly what that is yet and the rest of the 10 years looking at. So right. Um, yeah, so continuing on, capital uh, renovations. Um, is there a further discussion on this or any other further questions? I just wonder, you know, yeah, I know you have your plan <coughs> set up here. How much flexibility in this do you have? If you don't have the funding, you just keep pushing things back a year, I keep pushing back. Great question. We look at it every year. Um, have these conversations um, about you know where our biggest needs are, um, what we're able to do, what we're not. There are times when we have to make tough decisions um, and move things around in the, in the plan. It is yeah. flexible. And so, Commissioner Frazier's point earlier about the kindergarten additions, those are one of the things that have basically gotten pushed back right. every year on the four remaining schools that don't have them, right? They're saying, well, this isn't a top priority this year, so mm -hmm. it's been pushed back in the schedule probably six or seven years now? Probably longer than that, Mrs. Savigny, <laughs> because there's been a plan um, to get um, all of the schools to make sure that they each have appropriate kindergarten spaces. And, you know, with doing it on um, a phased in kind of basis, you know, these last four schools have really been without um, their spaces for many years. And again, I know we've had conversation about, well, you know, can we put them in other places in the school building, but the other places aren't necessarily set up as the early learning environments that we really need. Um, so again, you know, we do need to make sure that we take care of those 
schools needing those kindergarten spaces. And as we're saying in this conversation, we're also going to need preschool spaces um, as well. So, you know, we are going to need funding to support all of that. And she had a good point. Not only do we need the space, then we're going to have to hire more educators. Well, let me ask the question then. You're going to need the space. What is your projected time enrollment is going to hit and need that space? How many years are you going to need across the county, kindergarten, <laughs> things compared to, I mean, we're seeing the birth rates, we're seeing things come in. How many years do we have to do this? The, the phase in is un, under the bill as enacted, subject to possible change. The phase in was to begin this year, I think, at um, a 70 30 split and then, and then ramp up ramp up 5% a year, I believe, for this year until it hits 50 50. So, like a five or six fiscal year window. But again, there's a whole lot of uncertainty still about how many slots are we talking about. And we're blessed compared to some of the other counties because currently we do have space. It might not be the appropriate space. And then, just like everybody else, while all this is going on, we still have HVAC and roofs and other maintenance ongoing. And, and maybe it's worth noting, what, what we're doing in the interim until we know more and, and understand it a little bit better is something we were already doing. We're building out the um, existing pre-K sites that we operate presently those that are half day, we've been expanding those to full day incrementally, and we're continuing to do that. And that serves the kids. It also, um, the money follows that, that program development. So as we add, or, or as we transition those half day sites that we already <coughs> operate to full day sites, we do receive state funding in the subsequent year. So it's, it's, it's a lift for the Board of Ed up front, but then, you know, the funding so far under the phase in of the blueprints followed that. You can see all our pre K schools on your packet, page 32, and you them outside which ones are half day and full day. Oh, I see. Talked about the, you know, looking to transition to half day for us to expand. So this is going to, to me, dovetail <clears throat> into what's coming up in front of us in a couple of years, and that's developing our master plan for the county. Um, you know, our last master plan for the county was 2014, it's a 10 year requirement. So we're looking at the next Board of Commissioners, you know, as one of their requirements for that Board of Commissioners is to develop that master plan, which is going to obviously have a lot of school requirements, you know, in it and associated from the Kerwin plan forward. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be difficult because, you know, uh, you know, and we'll get to the redistricting piece and how, how places are growing and some of the requirements, but just understanding that your master plan, you know, for the school system and ours have to have to nest. And I think and this was mentioned at the beginning of the meeting. I think that's another reason why it's imperative for the two boards to continue mm -hmm. the line of communication because we're going to be sort of in a real time getting new information yep. um, that's going to be very valuable to both our boards as we think about <coughs> I agree. But some of these just modernizations, right? They're not full parent like East Metal. Uh, so that yes. would be, I, I would assume, cheaper. Never know in today's standards. Um, do we have a dollar and cent program or put on this by year at today's prices or roughly an estimate? Yeah, we do. I might have to call Mr. Prokop to the microphone. So when <laughs> we. Um, so, and, and I was going to say this, and I hesitated, so now that you've given me the floor, I'll say this. We'll send this to the delegation as you requested and, and request funding, but just remember that um, the state views these projects as a funding partnership, so mm -hmm. they won't commit funding unless you commit funding. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've, you've maxed it in, the, in the current plan what, you know, what your commitment was. 
us. So without, they, right. they, don't, they don't approve a project that we don't have a letter from you saying we're also committed right. to this project. With, um, with that being said, you know, one of the things that sometimes confuses folks is in the development or the planning part of a capital project, you know, how did you come up with that number that the school should cost that much? And then that gets refined as you move it to a real project and then an actual bid and construction cost. But we have to, as a part of that state approval process, development process, use the average square foot estimate that they provide us and then every county does and then we apply that on a worksheet that they also designate for us and so it's probably more complex than this and then Mr. Prokop always gets a little antsy when I speak in technical terms about his line of work but in essence they take the average public school construction square foot cost for that time period and send that out to all of the locals and say use this as you develop these projects that's why you see those initial budget numbers as they are but if we don't but we have to we have to develop projects that way at the beginning and submit them to the state for approval. So that's kind of how that how that process works. Ray, I don't know if you know the square footage construction cost at the moment or not. You should. You should know that. City. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking at for planning in the future we need to have a rough estimate I know it's pie in the sky it's going to change we don't know how bad in the future but right now I'm just predicting well I think that we only asked for um, authority from the or approval from the commissioners for the current year's capital or the, the next year's capital dollars but there is a 10-year projection behind that so you can you can certainly see that in the or at least a five year. It's a, it's a five, five year. year. What, what you have is not the budget document. This is the facilities master plan. It's sort of the planning document that mm -hmm. assesses needs, and then we pull the priorities from here and put them in the CIP request. When you get the CIP request in October, and it also goes to the state, that's a one year funding request and a five year window of funding. Because you know if you look at Career Tech or East, those are two or four year projects, so you have to look at it that way. And, um, and you've committed thus far beyond what the state has committed to. So we've maximized state traditional CIP funding on career and tech. And then um, the state came up with a separate new funding stream called the Built to Learn Act a couple of years ago. That's how East Middle is moving forward now. That our entire portion of that new stream of money went, went there. Um, but for instance, you had approved or you had authorized funding uh, upon Ted and his team's request for um, HVAC at Spring Garden, but we didn't get state approval during the normal uh, state commitment during the normal CIP timeline. So you're actually in some cases in advance of where the state is in terms of participating. Although we're hearing from them that, that they're now going to move forward and fund their portion of that project too. So that's how it works. A little bit of you and a little bit of them and we iron it out as we move through the through I mean, the does the state look at it that way where They'll backdate some of the monies that we've put forward and then do a match, or is the money we're putting forward lost? You say they, they look at it more of, um, they would just require a commitment letter from okay. you. I don't think that they really care about how you fund it. Or yeah. they, they look at their own timeline, and, and we yeah. have a lot of conversations with them about cash flow and how much we need from them in any given year just to keep the project afloat. Right. So they, they sort of do the same thing. Where so we can look at current tech over four years, but not three. I think it's important, too, that we make sure we maintain our school buildings so we don't have a situation as we did in 2015. I don't think this county wants to go down that road ever again. So I think it's really important that, you know, we do the best we can. You know, yes, things may change from year to year um, regarding repairs of that nature, but we definitely don't want to go anywhere near that ever again with having to close a school because something was not taken care of properly. Okay, okay. Okay, so where are we at now? Um, 23, Board of Ed budget process and priorities. Yep. Um, kick 
this off, and then I'm sure we'll have a. <laughs> Who wants to start looking at the slide deck? Uh, a, a deep discussion here. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, you're welcome to, to get there. I'll have a few comments here first, and then we're going to have some discussion. So, when we had agreed to postpone the, this joint meeting back from January until a future day, we, we were hoping to have some greater clarity of what we could expect from the state in terms of FY23 funding and the state's requirements or expectations of us under the new current legislation. I think you've already heard us talking about there's some things that are still unclear and some things that potentially are shifting. So with the release of the governor's budget um, in January, we do have a, at least a little bit better sense of our FY23 state funding figure. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that clearer sense that we're talking about as to what restrictions come with the funding under the blueprint or what the exact expectations are for us as a school system. That puts us in a kind of a challenging spot. Um, we know that there's going to be things that are required of us um, under, under blueprint. Um, so it's great to get funds from the state, but we also know there's going to be stipulations on exactly how that can be spent. Our board held a, held a budget work session and a public hearing uh, back on the 2nd, I believe, of February. And then at the February 9th um, Board of Education meeting, the board adopted a budget request, which was then forwarded to you for your consideration as part of your overall county budget process. In their budget request, the board adopted a recommendation from my proposed budget um, to seek $10.4 in ongoing county revenue, which is $4 million above the county plan. So in the meeting packet today, we've included um, presentations, I think there's two of them in here, for your reference. The first is the blueprint implementation presentation from November 10th uh, of, of this uh, school year, and that details the requirements of the five major policy areas under the blueprint. I think that's packet pages 37 to 40. Um, the second is the presentation from the board's February 2nd budget work session, um, and that's Packet, starts on packet page 41. And again, we want to have these for reference, so when we're talking about some of these things, uh, you can see some of the, the details. So the requirements, as we've discussed under the blueprint, are pretty extensive. And at this point, um, as we've said a few times now, we're still looking for additional guidance and clarity and, and timing um, and how it was passed. And, and we know that the state, uh, John said, has one, one person at the IAB um, and we're waiting to see what the, what the timelines are going to be. Um, the, uh, I have to stop for a second. Sure. My packet goes from packet page 36 to yeah. packet page 41. The 37, yeah, I, was 40 looking, your, I was looking it up on my email. We're missing those pages. We don't have 38 through 40. It's behind page 47. <laughs> so it's just out of order. Yeah, sorry. Okay. No, that's where I expected. No, they're just out of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's perfect. What? Um, okay. You just tried to trick us. Yeah. In reference yeah. to correct, right? <laughs> yeah. Keeping you on your toes. Um, it worked. It was on purpose for you. <laughs> so, so where do you want us to look? Do you want us to look at? I'm just referencing this right Got here. it. So I think okay. we can start. Okay. Start to start look here. Okay. So, Thanks. okay. Back to given what little guidance we have at the moment. Here are some of our big concerns. Looking. First of all, um, the blueprint requires us to meet teacher salary requirements moving forward. First is a 10% increase um, in teacher salary between June of 19 and July 1st of 24. That does not include steps. Now we've started to chip away at that in each of the past couple of budget years, but that's still a requirement of ours. A 10% increase over those years and does not include steps. By July 1st of 2026, starting teacher salary must be at least $60,000. What's our starting teacher salary right now, John? 48.5. 48.5. So we have a little bit of work to do. Um, we also are required to compensate teachers um, well above what we currently are for national board certification standards, and that starts next year. So that's $10,000 in compensation above um, what they're currently being compensated. Well, they're currently above getting their salary. Above their salary right? And that's also going to cause some compression for other scales. We have mm -hmm. other employees in our system, and so that's going to impact that. S 
staffing as it relates to the blueprint. There are the blueprint calls for limitations on the amount of time teachers um, can be um, spent actually teaching and more time devoted to collaboration. So that's going to cause us to look at how many employees do we have, how we need the time requirements for planning and collaboration and such. Um, mental health and behavioral support positions, technology support positions, all part of implementing the blueprint. We've already talked about the early childhood, uh, the pre-K requirements, the staffing that's needed to be implemented. That. We've talked about the physical building space, et cetera. So heading into the budget process, we've already identified some necessary expenditures totaling $6.9 million. This includes inflationary increases in costs like insurance, et cetera. We're picking up some program costs that are no longer being uh, funded by the federal or, or the state funders. For example, Title I, this is a, a good and bad problem to have, but our poverty rate has slipped mm -hmm. to the point where we're going to see, uh, we estimate about a million less dollars we get in the Title I program. We don't want to pull out the resources and supports we have in our Title I schools, um, so we're trying to account for that in our budget. We've dedicated $2.2 million to the people transportation category, largely to fund improvements to the formula through which we pay our independent <coughs> bus contractors. We have other system identified priorities. We've discussed in our work session the total approximately $13.8 billion and, in, and include, and this is on page 46 of the packet. Um, that, so just for an example, this is not I'm negotiating publicly here, but just to give you some examples, mm -hmm. we're a large organization. So to give our employees, all our employees, a step, um, it costs $5.2 million for, for one step to all of our employees. Uh, a 1% cost of living increase for all of our employees is $2.2 million. Thank you. Um, we've identified school-based priorities. If you remember, um, you know, we we spent a lot of time pre-pandemic going to schools and having town halls and talking to teachers and parents and stakeholders about the needs of our schools moving forward. And it's only been exacerbated by what we've experienced in the pandemic. And those resources really focused on school-based supports like counselors, mental health therapists, school psychologists, and special education teachers, um, among others. So, as you know, beyond the state, our other funding source is, is you, the county. And when you compare the 6.4, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. When you, when you compare that 6.4 million in the county plan for us in FY23 against the needs and priorities, it's more than accounted for and we're not able to fund uh, our most pressing needs. Just a, a little history, since FY10, Carrick High Public Schools has added a grand total in our operating ongoing budget of six positions. Okay, so in 12 years, um, now, mind you, we lost enrollment during that time. So during that time as well, the organization cut dozens and dozens of positions mm -hmm. during those same, same years. Um, we think the blueprint may prove to fund some of the requirements it brings for the increases that we're expecting also very reliant on the county to fund compensation for our all of our employees, all of, all of our deserving employees, <coughs> um, and the supports that our students and teachers very much need uh, in our schools moving forward. So I'll, I'll pause there. We put a few things in our fund balance to help, help limp us along. Um, we, we, uh, you know, we just went ahead and said, okay, we got to bite this off. This isn't a great long-term solution. So we added a few positions in fund balance, but those aren't permanent, they're not ongoing. There's, right. like, there's a cliff to that that comes, <coughs> mm -hmm. because that's not recurring money. Right. Um, but we're we'd, not- We'd like to keep them. We, we'd love to be able to you know, add those and others that we think we need to, to our ongoing, uh, ongoing expenses. This is where yoga helps. Breathe That's in, it. breathe yeah. out. Yeah. Just take a pause. So a question, Steve, on, on that figure. Since FY10, you've added six positions. That's across the board? That's correct. So, like I said, there might That's have been everything. <coughs> yes, there might have been. Administrative, boots on the ground, everything. Yes, and it might be that people retired or left and we re repurposed that position. Now, this is more needed, so we're, we're not going to do what you were doing. We're going to do. 
but the FTE count um, has <coughs> remained yeah. the same. So you might see a different title occasionally, yeah. you yeah. might see different responsibilities. <laughs> uh, but, and again, uh, you know, granted, the system had many years of declining enrollment. I know everybody experienced all the pains associated with that. Uh, but at the same time, um, moving forward, pre pandemic, we'll talk about enrollment here in a little bit, we were starting not only to level off, but to start to gain students. And, and needs change over time, um, and priorities change over time. And so we started to recognize we have needs, we have priorities that we need to address in different ways. Like I said, we focused our thinking on resources for our schools, resources that would directly impact students in classrooms and teachers supporting those students in our schools. So it sounds like the problem that was trying to be solved was the education system in Maryland. The blueprint was created, so now the problem is the blueprint, and the solution has to be how is the funding going to occur to ensure the blueprint is in place because it's mandated. And there are certain things in the blueprint that have to be done, right? I mean, there's no, I mean, there, there's, there, there's structure to it where there's no room except it will be funded. And that's the debate that's been going for no, two years. Yeah, ahead. but I mean. So if you have the answer to that. No, but isn't it, isn't it being done? This. Isn't the blueprint now being like, you know, blessed off and said, yes, it will be funded? Well, and the state said for those years, yeah, right. Carroll County doesn't have to put up any money. Don't worry about it. And right. guess what? We're sitting here today worried about it. Right. Yeah, well, yeah. They, that, that number was supposed to be about $17 million back when they were originally talking about right. it. And suddenly, it, it magically changed to six. Right. And right. That, that's a big difference when you're talking about our total budget. And when they put the charts there, uh, Ken, you know this, because you and I have this discussion, too. Uh, they based them on uh, a lot of MOE. Uh, the documentation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Carol looked really, really good. But the reality is, no, no one is really looking good. They're, they're not. They can put all the charts up they want, and they're, it just, the, the numbers aren't working. Well, and it's like Title I. We get punished because everybody right. has worked hard to make sure we've had good schools, right. and then we get punished for it. Yeah. So, it, yeah. They, they would argue, just for the sake of what you would hear right. somebody from, right. they, they would say, we funded the requirements of the blueprint. And in year one, at face value thus far, you could probably, ex I could probably say, yes, technically, there's enough state money here to fund those salary requirements that right. Dr. Lucker right. outlined and some other things, at least in year one but they haven't funded anything else. So if the school right. system wants to improve in any other way, or if later there's a future capital concern, mm -hmm. they didn't fund any of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you want to, if they want to give compensation to more than just those teachers that are highlighted in the blueprint, or if they want to add some other positions that are, any of those things on page 46, there's not blueprint money for any of those right. things. And that's, that's what it's looking like going forward. And I've, I've worked long enough here now to be able to say this, Jason Anderson used to say the one thing he learned from me was this, no matter what the state formula is, we're not going to do well under it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, 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 it's a cliff. Yeah, they, spot on. They, they created a cliff, is what they did. And $10,000 a teacher for now being board certified, that's a chunk of change, and that is ongoing then. Yeah, but that's been that way. I remember when I was uh, teaching. It, it was only five. I thought they offered me 10. <laughs> no. um, I was actually going to ask that question. Do you know how many teachers are board certified? Yeah, we have that number. Yeah, it's 60 something right now. 65 yeah. is a probably a good working number, and 17 in the pipeline. It's, uh, it's actually, and it could have been different, Commissioner Frazier, at one time, because bargaining could change things. Presently, before the blueprint in our negotiating agreement, it's 5,000 if you were a national board teacher before a certain date. Teresa okay. probably yelled at that date out. And 1,200 for more recent yeah. folks. So it's, there's a gap there, you know, it's not. So the, the compensation needs are, are real. And the, the support for our schools and our, and our teachers and our students is very real. If you remember in my first budget, um, I, I proposed 29 positions. And I recognized, right. based on some of the, the fiscal realities, but we, 
that was a realistic look at what some of the things that we needed right. um, to support our schools. It's, it's not unrealistic when you think about our teachers now, based on some of the impacts of the pandemic, are having to do so many different things, serve as a mental health um, and counselor, and therapist, and psychologist all in one because we're desperately trying to provide those services to allow them to teach um, instead of wear all those other hats. Our nurses, other staff have been stretched to the limits. Right. And so um, those, those 29 physicians now um, have sort of caught up with us. <coughs> we were able to add some special education support, which is valuably needed. I think that continues to be a huge need for us. May I frame it one last question? Sure. I promise I'll stop talking. What, what we've done in the budget that, that's been sent to you as a request is Essentially, this is loose terms, and wherever Chris Hartlow is, he won't like this either. But the money that's in your plan for us pays for the bills that Dr. Lockhart outlined mm -hmm. health care costs, Title I reduction in funding, et cetera, et cetera. That totals up to like 6.6 .6 or 6.7 million, and I think you have 6.4 in the plan roughly. The blueprint may pay for the very specific blueprint requirements, at least in year one. We're asking you to pay for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, do, do we have um, year two, three, four, and five? No, and it was hard enough to get year one. In fact, it, it was so hard that we had to wait for the governor's budget to, to get it. We had debates for a long time. Mr. Vicky referred to one of the fiscal note um, uh, charts from, from the first day it was uh -huh. until it, it, it varied over time, but the last number was $18.7 million for us. And that looked really good. I was planning to work another 15 years. Uh, it, it, it turned out to be 10.2. And Chris and I were trying to figure it out in advance of the governor's budget that we were estimating conservatively at 6.6, I think. That was our first. The, I mean, it doesn't look that great if you look at the DLS charts for the next two years, so 24 and 25, but then there's a significant jump in 26. We do know, for instance, that one thing that's going to happen in 24 is um, there's been a part of the foundation under the Thornton years, so from 2002 until now, called um, GCEI, the Geographic Cost of Education Index, and we've been a county that actually has benefited under that, under the formula. That's $2.6 million of state aid coming to us in 23 that we know goes away forever in 24. It's replaced under the blueprint, well, it goes away and there's something new under the blueprint called the comparative wage index. We're not a county that qualifies for funding under the under comparative wage. So I, I can't put it all together, but one for instance is that we know at the same baseline in 24, we go down by 2.6 million. And then there's variables like what's our student enrollment do next year, at, at, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that changes things. But it, it, it's not the, what, what's it's not their, the windfall we thought it was. What's their timeline? When can we hope for more information on the stuff? You think in a month, in two months, or? Well, it's, so what they're proposing is shifting the comprehensive <coughs> implementation plan timeline, and that went to Ways and Means as a uh, briefing, so now somebody will have to draft a bill. I guess the answer, Mr. Carler, is during this General Assembly, we'll know if that we gets hope. moved. But unless there's more comprehensive legislative action, what's now? We're negotiating. You know, none of those other time timelines are changing. So there's the National Board Certification, the 10 percent by 24, and the 60 thousand dollar starting. That doesn't change. Whatever yeah, that's not negotiable. I mean, that, that's that's, you know. Correct. Yeah. So, um, right. yeah, I, you know, as you know, the way we establish the budget is going out five years, and you know, you give us this, which is understandable, but how do we establish placeholders or put things out, you know, beyond that? Um, it's going to be extremely, I think, difficult, you know, beyond the swag. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, Steve, you've done this longer than I have um, as far as these type of things. We all do this just common. We just we can't, we get pushed into every year, and now it's, it's here. There's a lot of debate going on in the state about who's paying for what, and, and you know, it's ultimately going to be the responsibility of, of us because I don't, I don't see any magic money being made from 
the state. In the state. Yeah. Right. Now the feds seem to have it figured out. They're printing money somewhere. Um, but not, <coughs> not for this. But not for this. Right. So, you know, this is the, this is the <coughs> these are the debates yeah. that we've been having at the end of, uh, yeah. for the last six years, knowing that this was coming. And unfortunately, we're, we're the middle child. I mean, we're not Prince George's, we're not Montgomery, we're not Anne Arundel or Howard, Baltimore County or Baltimore City. I mean, that's the fact. And we're not subsidized like these little ones. But they're going to struggle, too. They're, they, they, they are. They're, they're, trust me, they're going to struggle. Too. Well, everybody, everybody's hurting hundreds with this. Hundreds of millions. They, they may struggle with mishandling of money. And, right, and the big guys. Yeah. yeah. They, if that stands, I mean, yeah. you know, Accountability is going to be a huge issue. That's right. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it boggles my mind that they keep yeah. putting the millions into places like Baltimore City. And where's it going? Basically, like, you know where yours is. is. Right. Uh, right. Uh, absolutely. We know, we, yep. we, we know where each, pretty much each penny is. Down like, to the penny. He might have yep. a couple in his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there, it's, it's, right. it's, it's like a it's like a well, sieve because so, and the problem is, they know that. You know, this is going to be the headline: Steve yeah, Wentz, so Baltimore it, City sieve. And then it comes down to us because I we're, agree. We're, we're thrown into the mix with them. Right. No, and 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 you so. you said no. You said it extremely well. Accountability and mishandling, of, and and we know that. But with that said, we know that's that's where these large chunks of dollars are going to go. And, and, and they're not ashamed to keep asking for more. Oh, money. absolutely not. <laughs> but, <laughs> not a bit. But, but, but the fact is, we've got to figure out, okay, we're going to be at a cliff, you know, after year one, and how do we put this in place? Um, okay. I think you guys just need to build a casino, and we'll just rake in the money that way. And apparently that's the yeah, solution. Well, that didn't work before because <laughs> casino money was supposed to go to education. Yeah. Right. Don't. <laughs> so now they're talking cannabis. Yeah, and, that, you know, that's supposed to recreational wise is supposed to go right. Okay, well, how did that work on the casinos? Right, it didn't. And one well, the racetrack money now and sports betting and, and yeah. lotter lotteries. So there's not even yeah. an answer there. Nope, nope, there's not. So. You know, we have. I guess Ted tells us two things every year. You can't build a budget on hope, can you? <laughs> no hope, and what are you going to cut? And that's what we keep getting all the time. What services are you going to cut? So I, I just. Uh, Ted says hope. He said, no, you can't build a budget on hope. Because <laughs> we're always uh, looking for that crystal ball and hoping something comes along. And then he hits us with uh, what services are you going to cut. And that really hurts. Yeah. When you, well, now, that's I, the thing. That. I think but the I last just, thing we need to do is cut from our kids anymore. Our, our kids are the ones that are suffering every time there's a cut here and there. And I that's know. something we just cannot do We're faced do with the anymore. same thing you are here, but that's I just... Uh, now, at the luncheon, without you guys there, he was very optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't throw him under the bus, would you? <laughs> Speaking so, of buses... Uh, uh, at least for the first part of the presentation. Yeah, there you well, go. Mr. Wayans, a couple of years ago, we had kind of taken a look at what the projection of growth rates were for the county and basically said, okay, we're going to levelize that. Like the, the school system will get the 3.1%. Yes. And, and that worked out quite well until the pandemic, like we, we were actually on a path to making this all work. And then the pandemic hit and kind of threw a wrench on the whole, the whole run thing. So basically, is it possible to get the, so the, the 4 million is kind of what we, we've lost out on in terms of the pandemic <coughs> and now hit. And I understand that the, the county's recovery is more on a one-time funding perspective more so than the long term but if we can kind of understand what the projected long-term growth is for the county and if we can do the four million plus levelize whatever that that is going I think that that's the that's the most that we could legitimately ask for from you guys right like if we understand what that growth rate is and then you know we, we do everything that we can um, from the, the state and the other side of the house you mean you're looking for four million on top of the six million that we're already giving? On top of the six yes. point four or six yeah. point. It is. It's the point. Yeah. So the, the four million was basically what we what we were down from the pandemic, right? right. So we, we still had to give um, 
you know, raises to employees, and, and a lot of that came from fund balance, mm -hmm. and, and so we're, we're basically, you know, we've got a structural imbalance that we're trying to fix at the same time that, that we're dealing with all of different ones. I think, so. um, no, I, I apologize, do you want to cut you off? Oh no, I was just saying, so, so the four million is really to kind of right size us from there, and then if we can, if we can do the, the long term, whatever that growth rate is, I, I think um, understand that you know ensuring that the priorities are very clear on what the above and beyond that four million you know is for the the biggest concern that I'm seeing in front of us is how are we going to get past year one? Um, it's not four million dollars; it's structured you know budget for year two, three, four, and five. <clears throat> um, and that, that has nothing to do with that four million. So, you know, that four million could be used for two, three, four, and five, you know, as a potential um, to stretch it. But like I said, there's some things that you threw at us, you know, and, and again, it's not first, first time news. We knew, like you said, this was, it's, it's a cliff that we're, you know, in front of. and. Um, so, I, so I think understanding that, take a look at how that four million could be used in two, three, four, and five, as opposed to just an additional four million now, um, if that makes well, sense. Well, we already know how it could be used. For, right? for like, those. So we're basically saying we, 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 we need 13.8, right? But we're, we're right. requesting four and basically saying, okay, we've got to figure out how to, how to tear down the, the prioritization already to get to the four. So. And the four means ongoing money. It's not one-time money. Is that correct? It is correct. Yeah, right, which makes it much more difficult. <laughs> no, and, and we understand that. Right. We, we fully do. Um, the one thing that we've kind of looked at, though, is that the, the school system portion of the overall county budget has declined over time. So each year it, it's gone down as a percentage overall. So we're just trying to, you know, given the fact that education is a priority, mm -hmm. trying, trying to trying to keep that portion up, right? And then match the, the county's growth rate. So we, we understand it's a big ask. Yeah. You know, and, and again, we're gonna, and I won't speak for my colleagues, but take everything into consideration to include, you know, all other expenditures and all other revenues that could take place uh, with the expectation, at least my expectation, that there will be no increase in revenues you know, that take place here in Carroll County, except for those that exist with the existing tax rates in place. But there's no, you know, expectation, at least from me, that those in tax in, uh, rates will increase, which is really the only way to bring in revenue into uh, the county. But then, at I mean, least the county revenue does grow every year, regardless of at about two percent. About changing the tax rates, right? That's, yeah. that's true, it's, but so that's, that's already that's already built into our five-year budget. To represent <clears throat> that we had talked about several years ago, the three point one percent. But, but yeah, it, but that two percent, right? The growth rate of two percent is sort of already into it's the embedded, numbers that yeah. we have right. as we keep going out. So we've already we've already got that. Right. So now we got to find more. That's the problem. right. But, but I think challenge. we need to look at what what if the growth rate is three or four percent. Um, I, I looked at it as a taxpayer prior to being on this side of right. the table. Right. About half my taxes go to the schools. Right. And it has been slightly decreasing. And if we get more growth, if we get, if 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 assessments go up, we should be able to get our fair share of the increase. You know, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. You've already got, hopefully, well, optimistic growth it, it, in the budget, right. but. But yeah. if it's more, you know, I felt I felt like when everybody got um, worried and, and pessimistic during COVID, um, mm -hmm. we spent a year with without money because we didn't think they were going to have it. Right. Then when some came, we didn't get any of it. And and I think we just need to look moving forward if if assessments going up if and, and it's a lot of ifs. And like you say, you know, uh, now I'm building a budget on hope, aren't I? Yeah. But but if it happens, we, we need to somehow get our fair for, share for, of that. Fortunately, <laughs> Carroll County, although had its challenges over the last couple of years, 
did very well on its main streets. Um, you know, speaking Sykesville, they lost one shop and it had nothing to do with COVID. We were able to subsidize um, small business um, through county dollars, state dollars, and federal dollars. Um, there's only so much large business here in the county. So, so the, the growth and, and the dollars, come, I mean, it, it really is limited. Um, the real impact in revenue growth would be through tax increases. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the sentiment, at least from me, you know, is that that should not be um, a viable option at this time going right into the post-COVID environment. I think that would be a very tough gut punch. I, and, and I agree. So, and, and like right. you guys have said it before, residential growth doesn't quite pay for itself. It, it would take a home basically of 350000 exactly. or more yes. for it to start paying for itself. Yes. Correct. Yes. Now, there are homes being built that way, but you're right. So, so the reality is there's only so much revenue that we yep. have, and the growth is, you know, 2%. 2%, you know, so, Ish. yeah, and, um, yeah, so that's kind of where we're at. And then we do have one-time funds and one-time dollars that did come in, uh, fortunately, from COVID relief, uh, from federal dollars, that we are using. Um, a large part of that has having to do with broadband, which is very important because we don't want to get stuck where we were before. and. A lot of other things, uh, social services, but okay. And you um, have to look. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm please. Cut you off. Please. Uh, I was going to say also, you're talking about your percentage of our budget is going down. Yeah. But we've also had stand up things like a, a paid fire and EMS service oh, now, and other things like that. So it's taken part of our budget, and there's other things besides that. But that's like the major chunk that we're looking at right now, and we're starting hiring process. We're going to have. It's just, it's a lot going on. And I understand your percentage has gone dropped, and it has, but it's because we've taken on more stuff on the, on the outside there. More services. I understand. And, yeah. and, and again, on, on a slightly smaller scale, we, we've done a lot of stuff to some board members chagrin pretty aggressive on trying to use fund balance and one-time money wherever we can mm -hmm. to try to stretch yeah. things. And, and we're a little bit doing that on hope. We keep telling ourselves, oh, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be there, we're okay. But <laughs> you, you worry about that too. You know, we haven't even started our budget yet. I mean, we have a lot of discussion, and that's the idea mm -hmm. you're presenting this today. So we have a lot of balancing. And right now, mm -hmm. our budget's like trying to carry jello in your fingers. It just doesn't work. Uh, we just have to sit down and start solidifying everything. Mr. Boucher, you've been very quiet. Well, I have a really big concern about inflation just wrecking everything we're doing and saying. And I'm going to give a prime example of that. We just gave our employees as of March 1st a 5.5% raise. Well, last year's inflationary price index was 7.5. So that means technically our employees have lost 2% of their consumption power. And no matter what we do with any of these numbers, by the end of next year, we're going to be faced with the same situation. And that really concerns me. Also, Commissioner Williams made a good point that us or we are responsible for that, but ultimately our citizens wind up paying for all this. And you made some very good points about those other jurisdictions. It puts us at a severe disadvantage because we seem to be good fiscal managers and we're good parents and we have a good school system, we get penalized for that. I think it's so vitally important that we, our delegation, fights all the time to try to bring that revenue back. And I, I said it before, I'll say it again, the Director Zaleski taught me when I first came on board that 34 cents on every state tax revenue dollar this county generates comes back. Baltimore City gets $3.75 back. I mean, we're all continuously be sinking in the hole Every time we improve our county, we're getting penalized. It's dreadfully annoying and it hurts us. I think that no matter what we do in any of these programs, it's going to be hopeless and we're still going to be in a hole. And that the inflation this year will probably be or most likely worse than it was last year. This is a dire situation we're in. 
And I think the only true salvation is how hard their delegation fights in Annapolis to try to rectify this. This is going to be a mess. Yeah, nobody, God help us all. Yeah, nobody's <laughs> mentioned inflation today, but it's it's scary. Right it's now. Kind of scary. Kenny, I mean, Kenny's in us. business just like I am. I yeah. feel it constantly. There's material I can't even buy right now. And all of our contractors and these projects are facing with the same situation. And I said it in my state of the county address that as soon as our budget started this year, our existing budget, we already had existing projects coming up increases. We're all seeing the same thing. So no matter what we do to accomplish this and make it look good, it's only going to look good on paper. And we're seeing that countywide. I know, you know, we're trying to make sure we catch up with wage increases for people working in various places. But on top of that, the business has to raise their price in order to make sure that they have the wage increase. But then also the product that they're getting, there's an increase on that. So it, it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's, it's extremely frustrating. frustrating. And I'm frustrated because I see the pain that our employees suffer. Not only our employees, but your employees. We hear it. We see it. You know, we're losing employees to the private sector. At least in the private sector, they can, they can raise their prices to, to try to help, but ultimately we're all paying for this. Another thing I'm very consciously aware about is, okay, we have property tax assessments going up. Our property values are going up. There's a, there's a yield restriction. And what scares me is that because of the yield restriction, inflation will outpace what we're bringing in. I, mean, I think we saw a lot of that during the epidemic is, you know, houses were going up for sale and there was bidding wars. So, I mean, a house was easily being sold $100,000 more than was originally priced. And then and surrounding neighbors get their property the assessments go up and then they yell and scream at us that we're raising our taxes, but we haven't raised any rates, but their assessments are going up. And the more inflation we have and the more national dollar devalues, the higher all their assessments are all perpetually go up. Their money is losing its value. Okay, so you want to reassess your $4 million ask? No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll tell you. <laughs> it, it, it's frustrating <laughs> this year because it is. Uh, but we still, and, and I understand what you're saying, we still got to do the best we can yeah, to plan. True. And, yes. and look at these factors and do what we can. But it, it's, it could get frustrating. It's, it looks pretty grim for all of us. Yeah, it's, this is not going to be a good couple of years. I would just ask that you know we continue to try to work with partners to figure this all out, right? Like we're, no, we're all in the we're same all, boat. We're all in a tough spot, right? Mm -hmm. Like let's let's figure it out together. I just want to make sure that all of our employees on both sides of this understand we know their pain, and we're focused on doing everything we can to address their needs. I know there's people out there worried about their groceries. For heaven's sake, families are worried about paying for their groceries. And we need to help take care of these people as best we can. The one thing that, that might help is that I think that you know we've we've had some very good marketing capabilities over over the last year. I know we, we know that a lot of people are moving into the county because they say, you know, you guys you have great schools. You're right. very safe, you know, like we, we were some of the first ones to open up in Maryland and I will tell that that um, open yes. up the schools in Maryland that brought a lot of families into our um, we have a lot of positives in Carroll County, um, from the schools, safety, um, standard of living. Is low crime. Low crime, yeah, it's, it's all fantastic, and that, that's like the marketing thing that I think is going to be bringing families in. And um, House does not stay for sale long around here lately. Okay. Where are we at? Talked about blueprint, talked about the 4 million employee compensation. I take it that was all part of the, uh, the blueprint piece, the 10% 10, 10 right. transportation formula revisions? Right, I referenced that in, in the comments that we have right. looked at that in our, in our budget. Efforts with other county entities with the Sheriff's Department. Uh, I take it that's the SRO program? At Some of the ways that this school system partners with other county agencies and nonprofits, I, I think that's one of the strengths of uh, Carroll County Public Schools and Carroll County in general. Um, so we have a handout in the packet that highlights some of the major partnerships with some of the larger agencies and nonprofits. 
certainly is an all-inclusive. Um, but you know, they're, they're uh, thoughtful and deliberative partnerships that are aimed to support our student needs. We're very appreciative of our county uh, partners and their services that are provided uh, to our system through these partnerships. Uh, but I wanted to give you some sense because you asked of a level of collaboration. I do want to say something about the SRO program. Um, it's fantastic. We're like number one in the state. People are looking at us. Um, they do a great job matching up uh, SRO officers to the school. But something happened this past spring that's never happened before. They had the SRO officer mm -hmm. speak at graduation. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, that's an honor. And it's always usually uh, a teacher or uh, yeah. In, in that category, but for them to select an SRO states volumes of how much they are appreciated and how much they are respected uh, in these high schools. And I will have to say kudos to that because that has never happened anywhere in the state of Maryland. And that was Deputy Harvey too, wasn't it? Yes. He is very much beloved by his students or the school, so to speak. He mentioned to me when he's out in public, kids will come up to him and start talking to him and thanking him. So he's very gregarious with people and sets a fantastic example. Yeah. And that the, just doesn't the, happen. Yeah, the like, SRO program yes. is outstanding in this county. Right. I, mean, no, I don't think it, it's equal to anywhere in my right. state. And, uh, and I do give the uh, sheriff credit here. He didn't put rookies in there. He didn't put right. people that retired. He put right. active. Right. A couple of years, uh, I don't know, a number of years under their service in right. the schools, and they interact with students. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just, I mean, uh, talk about uh, community policing. This is what it's yeah. all about he, right at this point. I, I agree. He matches the SROs to the schools. And, I mean, W. Harvey, fortunately, was in the right place at the right time with the JRTC and the, uh, the school nurse taking care of that young student. Um, and... Uh, yeah, he has a, a, a table at lunch where students go to uh, because they want to be with him. Uh, it started out that there were students to be in challenging situations, but now it's at a point where students want to have lunch with them. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's enjoyable to see. Um, and on the, flip, on the yeah. flip side of that coin, while that sounds tremendous, the SRO programs across the state come under attack almost mm -hmm. every year. So when you're talking about numbers and budgets, keep your eye on that too, because it can it, it it can rapidly become a huge problem, and it's typically, again, like the money is looked at at the big counties that want to decide what we should be doing based on what they are doing. So appreciate those comments, but it's a place to keep your eye on something because. Uh, I don't know that it's come up yet this year. I think there's enough, enough absurdity down there that they let it alone. Yeah, it done. But it did last year and the year before that and the year mm -hmm. before that. Sure. And individual counties and jurisdictions, like, some of them don't want them to carry a handgun. Right. I mean, it's or, just so or wear, stupid. Wear and khakis. It's, and yeah. it's just what you guys have said before. Mm -hmm. Carroll County is ahead of the curve. And then we get punished for it by these mm -hmm. other areas. We don't have negative attitudes about police in Carroll County because Jim DeWeese wouldn't allow them to behave like that. And we're blessed, but then we get punished by Annapolis who wants to right. put a roll on us. Yeah. So just good, it, it's a worry. Good point, but just remember to keep your eye on that because I do understand yeah. that, but they need to come to Carroll County and see how it how how it works so well here. It's yeah. amazing. And as you bring that up, I'm thinking I just read something recently where the SROs are being compared to SEEs or SSE school system employees, school security employees, and placing the umbrella of school security with the school system rather than the sheriff's department. Um, so there certainly are some comparisons that are being made between the SROs and these um, school security employees coming under the umbrella of the mm -hmm. school systems. So you're right, it's something current and something we should certainly keep our eyes on. The, um, the last few uh, 
you know, items, and I think more relatively just uh, facts to share with us. Um, you know, with uh, superintendent uh, departure, um, a search is happening, and the timeline, I expect milestones. Um, if you want to share with us uh, and the community how that's going. Um, enrollment figures, we talked a bit about it um, as uh, enrollment, um, as enrollment figures. And then uh, lastly, dealing with the um, redistricting. And you know that's been a pet rock of mine from day one, uh, especially as there's two very large residential areas down in the southern part of district. One that feeds into Carrolltown, one that's gonna feed into Freedom Elementary. Both um, now zoned uh, residential and both have developers uh, that look like they're gonna be in place. Um, both will be very challenged to be developed with residential as both Carrolltown and Freedom are getting to hit their, you know, capacity. So uh, as that happens, how is that redistricting, um, you know, focus? So if we can start, you know, maybe superintendent. Uh, I, I can hit the superintendent search, sure. I think, quickly and then entertain questions. But all the board members, before it started, had to sign confidentiality agreements. And we've met, we picked Maeve as our consultant to do the search, which is who we used last time, who did a pretty good job. Um, and uh, we've met with them. <laughs> we, <laughs> I, I, I can honestly say you did an awesome job. Pretty good. I, I will. Yeah. Um, tell you. But um, yeah. the application process started February 1st. There's a deadline of March 7th. We have our applications. Um, Mabe is reviewing them. We will meet again to fine tune our process. And because our existing superintendent um, is the kind of guy he is, he gave us plenty of notice so we could start to search in time to hopefully have somebody in place in, in June. And, and that way if they have to move, they have to do whatever, they have time to do it and we can maybe have some overlap. Okay. And you have a good controller in place too now. Evidently, I yes. Am. That's what I've yes. been told. Well-trained guy, right? right. <laughs> okay. You know, it's fair, we're very, uh, I guess attuned to who the superintendent is. It means a lot to us. And I, I just want to say, I think you have done as well as your father or better. So yes, I think a that's, lot. Thank you. Yes. That uh, I, I think is, is quite a compliment to you. So, it is. Thank you. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, and, and again, I've said it before. Um, I wish he didn't decide to not renew his contract, but like the gentleman he is, he gave us plenty of notice. Mm -hmm. He's gonna honor it. He's gonna help <laughs> us keep moving forward and I respect that big time. Um, and, and, and several again, of us worked uh, under the, his father in this room here. <laughs> yeah. The question I was asking at an event last night and, and I don't know where we are with this, but um, are we just gonna hire somebody to fill a spot and what happens if we don't get anybody qualified? And, and I said, I can't speak for the four ladies, but I mean, my vote will be if we have to do an interim because there's no quality. I mean, we've got, I think nine of the 24 school systems now have, are searching for superintendents. So right. it's, right. I see somebody shaking her head. It's almost as competitive as finding a teacher. <laughs> yes, superintendents and health officers. Yes, yes. In the state. <laughs> yes, same thing. So, so that's kind of where we are. The last and two uh, years. Um, I'm happy we do have some applicants, and they seem to be, Mabe seem to be happy about them. Yeah. We haven't seen them yet. They yeah. do a, a, a pretty strict review mm -hmm. and, and, and vetting them, and they're in the process of doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And can I, is, we would be remiss in saying that you know we'll have community input yes. um, sessions for sure as part well, of the process. Well, we did we did the initial survey and reviewed that and made that part of the process in in how we were deciding what we're doing. And as we get down to the end where we don't have to be confidential anymore, we're going to seek community input. Yes, good point. No, thanks. Um, Enrollment, we talked about some okay, so already. Right, there was, I think there was a question originally about our enrollment. So starting on page 
49 of the packet, you can see our official enrollment is certified for the state that they fund us over the last three years. So you've got 20, 21, and 22 on the pages consecutively there. In general, our projection for this year was that we'd recover about half of the student enrollment decline that occurred during the first year of the pandemic. And okay. in the aggregate, we were pretty, pretty close to that um, with this year's official enrollment. Um, we only see that continuing to um, increase Mm -hmm. uh, this was as of November 8th, uh, so we were about then almost 300 off of the pre-pandemic mark. Okay. Left, but we know that that's continuing to increase. So it's relatively flat, I mean, at this point, but it's moving in the yeah. upward direction. Yeah. Okay. Now, they've held you home, har hold you harmless on enrollment for the last few years. So you've been getting the money from what year? They, they, yeah, the state has held us harmless under even the current formula. So they, they just, um, they did a couple of things. First, they just ignored the first pandemic year for this year's funding. They treat it like, it, like it's not an enrollment year. And then going forward under the blueprint, they've made permanent the three-year rolling average. Um, so, you know, if our enrollment continues to tick back up in a positive direction, see that impact of that one sharp year of decline, it would be a three-year average, never counting the first year of the pandemic, the, the year of the dramatic drop. How, how much, just ask me, how much have you lost here in the last 10 years? Do you have any idea? Of state aid or? Yeah, state um, money's coming in. I'd somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 million, I believe it was, during, from fiscal nine to, th during that first decade. I, I can go back and put that yeah, no, that, double, that was just one. That would make a significant yeah. difference. It was, it was a huge. It wasn't good. <laughs> yeah, I, I. And that's nobody's fault, and right? things happen. Uh, right. Okay. Well, there was no hold harmless for all of those years. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Rothstein, I think yeah. there was one of the things on staffing update. You see that on the agenda as well. Um, you know, the. Uh, fluid process as it relates to staff. Mm. So taking a little snapshot at any point in time um, required a little bit of clarification. And at times during the pandemic, we, we struggled with vacancies, mm -hmm. but also providing coverage um, due to employees who may have been on leave or absent quarantine for a specific period of time. I will say to you, and I don't want to <laughs> say that, but um, at least in the last uh, Several weeks, um, things have improved significantly for us. Um, our sub fill rates are in the mid to upper 90s, which we were hard to get that right. kind of uh, fill rate pre pandemic. Um, so, you know, I think everybody knows our, our goal is to keep the schools open and keep them stood up, and that required a lot of uh, collaboration and work and people dropping whatever they're doing and going to help. Um, and we did that. Um, we're finally at a place, again, I don't want to make that where it's, it's, there's still some challenges, but we're in a much better place in terms of um, you know, our self-fill rates and, and uh, vacancies. And vacancies have improved tremendously. Right. We, we didn't want to put something in your packet because we were preparing this earlier with Roberta and, and then the numbers weren't going to be accurate mm -hmm. the day. I, I do have numbers that I had um, asked Mr. Diaz, our HR director, to pull today. So if you have a specific question of where, how many vacancies are in a certain area, I can answer that as of today. I, I would just say in general, where, where we have persistent struggle, because things have greatly improved, as Dr. Locker said, it's in the areas that are hard to fill anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's not only special ed, but it's largely special ed. So, we have some vacancies for special ed teachers. They've been slow to fill. Um, we have a number of assistants who, who um, classroom assistants <coughs> who serve special needs students and, mm -hmm. and meet their, their supervision mm -hmm. needs. Those, those remain hard to fill. Other than that, we had a lot of vacancies in a lot of areas a couple of months ago. We, we pretty much caught up in most areas, um, you know, more or less. It fluctuates, but right. things are much better now in general than they were, say, in January. 
Well, I used to be a special ed teacher, but that was many decades ago, so. There you go. No. Job. How is the substitute pool now? So the substitute pool is, is a little trickier because those aren't folks who necessarily work every day. We still have over a thousand people in the substitute pool, which would be pre-pandemic type, type numbers. But that just means that there are people in the pool who say they're willing to sub. On a given day, it's who shows up to right. sub, who answers right. the phone or who goes into the internet and, and, and takes the slot. Those fill rates, that's what Dr. Lockett referred to as fill rates, those fill rates were, were very challenging in December, January, maybe even November, 70% um, or lower. And that's when a lot of folks were going out to schools and other creative things were happening. Um, those are now in the, in the 80s to sometimes mid 90s on a regular basis. And so, I, you know, it's hard to quantify why did people sub now versus then, and, it, and it's never, I mean, it's never really been a, a clear pattern throughout the pandemic. There's been times where it's been better and times where it's not been as well. But and right now, things are and, and much Dr. better. And Pretty Dr. Locker, could, but if, if, if you agree, could you touch a little bit on, because of all this throughout COVID, there were numerous bonuses giving and increases giving in various things to mm -hmm. help full spots. Can you, you mind touching on that just a little? Yeah. And, and Several of them, again, we're patting you on the back a bunch today. Were your, <laughs> were your proposals? So, our, you know, it goes without saying, our employees continue to do incredible work, and, and are, are the, you know, the reason we've been able to do what we've been able to do and, uh, to the best we can. I, I'm not going to remember them all, but last year we started with incentive, um, bonus pay for employee groups. Uh, based on some of the real challenges we had last year. This cuts across all of our employee groups. Um, this year we provided um, a $1,000 bonus to all of our um, employees for this year. That will come in April and June. Um, we, we temporarily added on, meaning not forever, but for the rest of this year, we added on to the daily sub rates. And it's hard to quantify, but I assume that helped in some yeah, way. Mm -hmm. So you, you get more than you would otherwise get to sub for the rest of the school year. Covering um, classes, we increase the, right. somebody's asked to cover a class, we, we uh, work with our association to, to provide some additional support there. We also increase the pay for ex well, extended learning opportunities, which are happening during the school year after school, paying teachers to work with kids, tutor students, and then summer, last summer, and we're planning for it again this summer, summer recovery at a premium level of pay. Um, our teachers need a break too. Um, and so uh, we, we need to look to incentivize folks to, to you know, we have made, we didn't make it all summer because kids need a break, certainly. Um, but uh, we have outlined again five weeks this summer, opportunities for kids to really get uh, caught up mm -hmm. and supported. And so we want to make sure we are paying as best we could our employees that, that Back you said in um, November, even though they're not our employees directly, the Board of Ed approved um, $1,000 signing bonuses for bus drivers, uh, right. which were distributed through the contractors to them, too. You said that the, uh, you had your teacher slots basically filled. Are they filled with certified teachers or, or not? Yes, in most cases. So we're, we're down to, well, let me answer that by saying, we can't have a classroom vacant, so in the meantime, if, if, it, if it's still showing as a vacancy, there's some type of a substitute reporting right now. Um, we are, at this very moment, down to 17 teacher vacancies, most of which are special educated, education or related services like speech language pathologists, mm -hmm. et cetera. But all the teachers that you have teaching the classrooms are certified teachers now? Yeah, they have. That's what I well, I mean, there, might, have be, to be. You know, you, you, there might be cases where somebody's on leave because of pregnancy or right, something like that, right, where there's right, a temporary. Okay. Are your recruiting but, efforts paying off? Are you getting some out of college, the younger guys, or is this, you're just competing with everybody else across the state? Well, this is where the compensation conversation comes in all the time because we are constantly competing with everybody else. And um, we have to um, look outside of Maryland to, to find teacher Maryland's colleges don't provide enough right. um, certificated graduates every year to fill the needs in probably a couple of counties. So, yeah. so yes, we're in constant competition with everybody around us all the time. And the blueprint is actually going to exacerbate that. 
Right. Because they basically right. decrease the amount of planning time, which mm -hmm. means you have to have more teachers. Yep. And so more teachers at a time when they're that much harder to find. So. We are returning to in-person recruitment venues this spring. So there haven't been very many in the last couple of years, but more and more mm -hmm. traditional re recruitment uh, areas are right. now showing us that we can show up in person. Okay. That should make the difference when Ernesto Diaz back there in the corner shows up in person. <laughs> And yeah. are we offering more open contracts as we go out to these venues? We have been. Um, and so, so an open contract is when I meet you at a recruitment fair, if we'd, if we'd love to hire you, we can say, hey, hey Steve, sign this contract right now. We had been, um, it had been very, very challenging, if not impossible, for us to do that over the decade of, of the losses in state revenue and the, and the various cuts that went with it because we couldn't hire people and then later rift them. And so we were sort of uh, limited, whereas other systems weren't. Um, in the past year, we, we did have much greater flexibility to open offer, open, offer open contracts and try to get people's commitment a lot sooner. So we're hopeful all of those things will help. OK, I mean, a lot of marketing being done, but the sale is done by the individual. And we know that. So <clears throat> the more you have the opportunity to get in front of somebody, and say this is why Carroll County matters and CCPS is the best, that's going to get them signed. So, um, yeah, I agree. And, and you're right about the blueprint. So, you even recruit from uh, the uh, county uh, office here. So that's, that's good. <laughs> yeah, no, you're yeah. not. No, you're not. Okay. Uh, oh, did I? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to the Southern Area of this yeah. Committee. So we've discussed at a prior joint meeting when we uh, reconsider reinstituting what was formerly the Freedom Redistricting Committee process. And we wanted to confirm this fall's official enrollment and indicated when we come back to the Board of Ed for approval. We did that in December. The Board acted to form a Southern Area Redistricting Committee and they begun mm -hmm. their work. Um, and that, I think, is the last page. Um, you can right. see the Board item there in your packet. Uh, give some background on the general timeline. So the group is formed. Um, we work with schools that may be impacted to ensure we have sufficient parent representation and communication. We're also grateful that a couple of folks from the county staff are, are joining mm -hmm. the process again. And uh, at this point, the committee's had three meetings, I believe, um, establishing the district yep. baseline of data, background information. And as the committee work moves forward, we'll update the appropriate we have a, a section on the board website where we continue to put updates and information, uh, meeting schedules, meeting documents, et cetera, and we'll certainly keep the commissioners uh, posted. On Definitely appreciate it. I believe our director of planning, Linda Eisenberg, is on that committee. And, uh, and that's important as the planning commission continues to be challenged sometime with some of these developments that are limited because of the schools, you know, and uh, you know, especially as we're seeing down in the south. So, okay. Both Linda and Laura Mackay. Hey, that's right, and Laura's on it too. Yeah, yeah. So I think we just need to be very open um, and transparent and, and broadcast this information as mm -hmm. early and as often as we can because people buy houses, yep. right, based on where they think that their kids are going mm -hmm. to go to school, mm -hmm. right? So if you change where they're potentially going to school. Oh, absolutely. The house. It creates an uproar yeah. in, in the community, right? Like I know Freedom, we keep talking about, you know, redistricting Freedom. I, it, it's one of the top performing schools in mm -hmm. the county. I'm not sure that parents want to leave. No, right. nobody like, wants to leave. Us. No, I, I know. Crowded. They don't want to be pushed to. No, I, I, I agree. It's just yeah. that the growth in the, like the Beatty property and a couple other parcels that are relatively large that feed into Freedom can't grow unless something happens. Um, and so it's just this empty space. So we gotta figure out either expand a school or move folks from one school to another where it has a better fit. Um, I, I, trust me, I 100% agree and I get the same feedback from Freedom and from Carrolltown and Piney and all the others that feed into Liberty and Century. Um, yeah, you're not gonna get the argument from me on that. I just, you know, believe we need to look at where the growth areas are in the county, which are the municipalities and the one large freedom growth area, and say, okay, how do they impact our public school system? And if, you know, as they grow residentially, will it have impact on our schools? And if it does, 
how do we need to make those adjustments and communications is paramount to all of this you know no doubt and any quick decision is the wrong decision so yeah this is a very unpopular thing to do I understand that big time however without the money to build other schools and you have less enrollment other places you don't have much choice other than to pursue redistricting at this point and I I I don't, you know, uh, I, I, you have to explain it to people that way. This, you know, you're overcrowded here, but we have capacity here. Uh, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes, let's put it that way. Uh, this is a very unpopular thing to do, but it's something that mm -hmm. periodically has to happen. Right, like I'm not saying that it shouldn't be done, because it, right. it, it has to be looked right. at, and right. we, we yes. have to come up with some options, yeah. right? But and just, again, it's the whole partnership thing. Oh, like, no, I, I get you. Yeah, and it, it's going to be a big issue for the community, <clears throat> and we all need to be simpatico in the message that we'll be And, and I think so. we got to look, um, same with you guys, if it wasn't for COVID, we'd have some of our 29 people. We, we'd be done this redistricting committee talk, mm -hmm. but everything got shut down and and it to me it was uh, not surprising but just a fact of life there were people in the first committee that didn't have kids in that school anymore right. you know i mean it, it's it's it really held us up and but i don't see how we could have effectively done it during that time period but yeah it, it's it's tough enough like you're saying anyway yeah but but then you go through this and, and it, it's right. a, it's a hard enough but it's but i agree and, and it's one of the things i said um, when, when I was running for this position, we need to look at redistricting, and people mm -hmm. don't want, you know, it's not a four-letter word. Mm -hmm. It's We need to talk about it, yeah. you know? Oh, absolutely, and uh, same thing when, you know, I started as well, because I saw the impact. Appreciate the candidness, appreciate the openness um, that we're having, and definitely would like to continue this as we move forward, as we walk into the budget uh, session. We don't need a joint meeting while we're doing that but doesn't mean that we can't have the conversations um just like anything else and we finished with the redistricting a lot of the conversation that we had is uh folks think that we should keep up with the joneses or whatever that comment is the baltimore counties howard counties and arundels where they're able to build schools because everybody wants turf fields and build schools you know and new schools and that's not how we're designed you know um we are very proud to be fiscally conservative and AAA rated and having the best schools in the state and the best teachers um, and education. Uh, you process. said it earlier, we're the middle kid, but we're proud to be the middle oh, kid. It, we're Jan. <laughs> so it's, um, we're rocking it. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so the fact is just continue to uh, share the message. Um, you know, you're not shy and I know that. So uh, let us know what the needs are always um, and again appreciate your time uh, Mr. President any no I just want to thank comments? everybody great conversations great discussions and that's how we get things done but communication is the key to everything we do and we serve in a lot of boards and commissions we have a communication with each board and commission so we know what's going on and with the school board these joint meetings are because you are half our budget so they're very important i know it's gone down a little bit but it's almost half what's that no it's gone down a little bit but it's almost half but i have to say i always leave these meetings feeling optimistic that we've talked some things out and that we're moving forward if, if i may before we close out dr locker you broached a little bit on uh, mental health earlier that's a big concern of mine and we've seen on national news how there's a spike in juvenile suicide, mental health, and addiction. Where are we with our student population on those issues, and what type of resources potentially do we need to allocate to them? And I state this, because when I did my first budget with you, this was one of the subjects you brought to me, and I respect you for that. And I don't think the situation has gotten better with the COVID situation on top. So I was wondering, is there any update on that, and where are we at? Well, update in terms of how our how our students are. Do we see anything negatively going on in our school system with all that? You know, it's a private issue, but is it cropping up in the school system? Yeah, I, I, you know, I can speak anecdotally to you. That's yes, why please I, do. I spoke to you today about the need for more mental health supports. Um, 
counselors, therapists. Obviously, you know, we saw a lot of um, behaviors, concerning behaviors coming back. We see some kids in need. Um, and a lot of those services and supports that they traditionally benefited from, they got in school or got connected to in school. And now being in school, you, you're, I read a statistic just the other day, uh, you're, you're about 50 to 60% more if you're a student likely to seek out and get services and supports if you're going to school, whether it's through at school or connected through some of these partnerships like Absolutely. we talked about. So the nonprofits are yes. supportive. Yes, the, the, the ones that we referenced earlier. And so that is a concern of ours. We did build into our, um, our, our fund balance uh, the need for a, a substance abuse prevention. Um, specialist who's been working with us for a couple of years. That was huge because they're starting to be a liaison to over the last couple of years. Is that a tough thing to fill like the, the special education teachers? Is, well, is this a field that's hard to recruit in as well? Well for that because we only have one it, it wasn't as hard. Um, I, you know special education realm we're talking multiple positions and that's that's harder for sure. I know our counselors um, particularly at the elementary and middle level, um, you know, have concerns about some of the things that they're they're seeing, some of the things that that um, for the interruptions that we've experienced and some of the trauma uh, that students have experienced that plays out in our classrooms. Um, that's a that thing. affects the peripheral ch children around. Sure, Ab absolutely right. And um, you know, somebody somebody used the analogy if if you're if, if even one student in the classroom is having challenges, um, that can affect everybody in the classroom in, in mm -hmm. those ways. Um, and so it, it, it can be unsettling or unnerving and, and challenging, particularly depending on the age. And so that's something that we've, we've built into the uh, into our thinking. We, we started thinking about this pre-pandemic because mm -hmm. we knew it was a need. I think it's been exacerbated, to be honest with you. Um, it does require more resources. And that's that's why that's on top of, of everything else you're doing. That's part of the that's part of the ask, right? Dr. Locker, I also like to touch on we have sources of strength. Um, even during the pandemic, when schools mm -hmm. were virtual, they did have sources of strength meetings virtually. Um, so having that program in our schools is very important as well, and making sure that our staff is getting the proper training they need to implement those things into the, each individual schools, it's phenomenal. Yeah, I appreciate you mentioning that, Ms. Battaglia. That's a, a program where, you know, we recognize we have students um, with needs where we're trying to provide training, as Ms. Battaglia mentioned, and then also other students can serve as supports or, or peer mentors for students. A lot of times we know our students are also willing to go to their peers or their, or their friends uh, for support. So we can point them to a trusted adult point them to somebody in the building who could be a resource. So it's not like we're sitting around waiting. Um, there's a lot of proactive things happening, but I can tell you, um, talking with teachers, talking with principals, uh, being in schools, we definitely have felt um, some of the impact as it relates to um, how uh, social and emotional well-being. And um, look, if you're not available mentally um, or emotionally, Being a teacher is a lot more difficult than it used to be. Okay, so Dr. Torshi? Yep. I appreciate the discussion. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, thanks for listening, and again, um, thanks for being opened um, to you know what our needs are. Um, that's what we're asking. We know it's not an easy thing to hear that yes mm -hmm. we need all these dollars yep. to do all these wonderful things but as you said you you, you knew it you have known that it's been coming um, so here we are and um, I said listen, yeah. listen to you learn from you lead together with you mm -hmm. and we'll get it done mm -hmm. Ms. Herbert anything yeah, thank you all uh, we just need more evaluation okay ladies no, just keep the discussion just, going just yep. anybody that has a sticker. If you want to go out the side door, Andy has <laughs> volunteered to take them, and that way they won't think you spent the night. <laughs> Sounds good. With that, I need a motion to adjourn.
Okay, you need a second. I'll, I'll second. second. I got a motion, lots of seconds. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.